Okay, thank you everybody for joining. We're gonna give it just a minute to let um, other people uh, jump on. All right, it's right at two o'clock, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, hello and welcome to the GridPoint webinar, Advanced Energy Insights and Analytics to Extend HVAC Health um, and Equipment uh, Life. Uh, we're excited to have Energy Analytics Senior Manager, Jack French, and our Director of Solutioning and Sales Enablement, Gerald Zingraff, as our featured presenters today. Uh, they will be discussing some common HVAC challenges and the newest insights and analytics into HVAC systems that will help extend the life of your equipment. My name is Marcia Degman. I'm the Director of Marketing here at GridPoint and I'll be the moderator. Uh, before we begin, we do have a few housekeeping items to go over to ensure you get the most out of this presentation. Uh, please use the Q&A featured in the menu uh, at the bottom of the screen to submit any questions at any time during the presentation. We do have time set aside uh, at the end to answer um, and address all of your questions. If you experience any technical difficulties, um, please send me a message via chat, uh, send it directly to myself, uh, I'll help you troubleshoot. There are poll questions throughout the presentations. Uh, the, prompt, the presenters or myself will prompt uh, you when it is time for a poll, uh, it will automatically display on the screen for you to select your answer and submit. And then we also show the results immediately afterward. Lastly, there is a survey uh, and we kindly ask that all attendees complete this once the webinar concludes. It's short, only six questions. It should only take you a minute. Uh, we are recording today's presentation. Uh, we will have the on-demand version available on our website within the next few days. We will also be emailing it out to all uh, attendees. Uh, to get started, I'd like to introduce our presenters. Uh, Jack French, um, as I mentioned before, Jack began his, uh, is our uh, energy, uh, senior manager for energy analytics. There we go. <laughs> um, Jack began his career in IT consulting where he designed and implemented algorithms to identify non-compliance for the Missouri Department of Revenue. Uh, our next presenter is Gerald Zingraff. Uh, Gerald has nearly a decade of experience uh, developing energy efficiency strategies and technology tools. Gerald offers deep industry insight to developing a network of smart and connected and efficient buildings. Today's agenda, Gerald's gonna be kicking off um, discussing some common HVAC challenges. We'll move then into the benefits of proactive monitoring of your HVAC systems. And then finally wrap up the presentation with an overview of how to integrate an energy management system into your HVAC system and provide real life uh, energy savings example from a grid point customer. And with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Gerald to get us started. All right, thanks Marcia. Yeah, so uh, we're going to talk about uh, some common challenges, and you'll you'll really notice a couple themes, uh, really really two themes popping up over and over again. Uh, the first is lack of insight, uh, what's actually happening at your site, at your units, and the second is lack of control. So the first uh, point here you see understanding the health of your HVAC units. Uh, I, I was actually working with a facility manager at a movie theater chain a couple years ago uh, with with GridPoint, and he was complaining that. Uh, that corporate, just, they never prioritized the r and budget. It just had small incremental increases every year. It was never enough. The units were constantly failing. Uh, and, and he could never make the business case to get more money uh, for, for these replacements uh, and for these issues. Uh, so he, he talked all the time about self-generated tickets uh, every year, and that just never moved the needle uh, enough. So having real data into the health of your HVAC units is, is a, I think, a, a real challenge that a lot of facility folks uh, and, and development folks uh, are, are experiencing today. Uh, reactive maintenance is the second point here. Uh, this, is, this is, I think, you know, pretty common across the board. It, everybody wants to move to proactive maintenance. Everybody talks about preventative maintenance and, and going and you know, doing uh, filter changes and, and diagnostic testing, et cetera. Uh, but most folks are, are in this bucket of just reacting. Uh, we're working with a, a, a handful of Burger King franchisees, but there, there's one that uh, they're mentioning just they have no insight into what's going on at their sites. 
uh, no insight into what's going on at their HVAC units. They were relying 100% on just hot gold calls from their site managers. Uh, they would get an employee that would call and scream uh, saying that the, it's too hot or too cold. Uh, and oftentimes the only way to, to address that is just to roll a truck. And that leads to a lot of unnecessary truck rolls, uh, which leads to the next point there, investigative work to understand issue severity. So oftentimes if you don't have insight into your HVAC health, into your HVAC performance, into uh, just the operational status of your units, uh, then you actually have to send somebody out to investigate uh, what the issue is, what the severity is, how to prioritize that. You're really relying on, it's a, it's a time consuming and, uh, and cost, uh, uh, a very, very costly exercise of, of getting trucks out there, relying on human data uh, to come back to you. And then you've got to do a lot of manual effort to, to prioritize these things. Uh, one of our big box retailers actually, uh, prior to Gridpoint, they had a, a very oversized budget for r &M. So the opposite of, of this uh, movie theater chain that I'm talking about uh, uh, previously. So they had a very oversized budget. They did this because they needed this budget because they're constantly rolling trucks because of the complexity of their sites, the complexity of the issues. Uh, they're rolling trucks just for investigative work. Uh, they had no insight uh, in, into uh, temperatures, supplier temperatures, uh, uh, compressor loads, short cycling. N none of this uh, data was being bubbled up to them uh, and, until they actually sent somebody out there. And then every issue needed some sort of root cause analysis to identify what the source of the issue is, the severity of the issue, that data comes back. And then they've got to spend a lot of time uh, stack ranking all these issues against each other. So very, very costly, uh, very, very time consuming. And the last thing, uh, uh, challenge that we're seeing a lot of, especially today in this you know, post COVID world, uh, supply chain issues. Uh, if, if you're running your, your sites uh, with a run to fail methodology for replacements, um, which a lot of a lot of our uh, customers and, and folks that we talk to in the in the industry and in the restaurant and retail space, they're forced to to, to kind of do this and, and operate their business this way. But if you do that, uh, then when a HVAC unit does fail, uh, we're seeing lead times of six, nine, twelve months, uh, sometimes in excess of that, depending on how many units you need and and the kind of custom fit of that unit for your site. Uh, so if, if you have a, a location uh, with two or three rooftop units and one or two of them need to be replaced, uh, that's impacting your revenue. It's impacting your store hours. It's impacting how often you can be open. Uh, and, if you're, and if it's impacted for, for nine or 12 months, uh, oftentimes uh, there, there's a, there needs to be a business decision on if it's worth even keeping the store open. Uh, so it's a difficult decision to have to replace an HVAC unit and then have to, because of that, decide should we keep the store open or not uh, for, for the next nine months. So uh, these supply chain issues are becoming real uh, and we're seeing that uh, more and more uh, as, as we uh, you know, just really talk to folks in the, in the market. Okay, jumping in with our first poll question. Um, what are the most pressing HVAC challenges you are experiencing today? Um, and I'm going to go ahead and put that up on your screen and we'll give everybody a minute to uh, answer. I apologize, it looks like I posted the wrong one. So thank you for answering these correctly, everyone. What strategy do you use for HVAC replacement? Sorry about that. Uh, run to fail on a schedule every 12 years, predictive failure with data and reporting. This uh, The poll question number one will come a little bit later then. All right, we'll go ahead and turn that off and share the results with you. So it looks like run to fail. We have 40% of people say that their HVAC replacement strategy is run to fail. Okay, turn it back over to you, Gerald. Sure, yeah, let's go to the next slide. And, and that's actually not surprising. Uh, run to fail is, is the most cost-effective option. 
uh, but it leads to the steepest consequences uh, when, when we have supply chain issues like we're seeing today. Uh, the alternative of, of doing it on a schedule, uh, this is a hard thing to do. Uh, we see, we work with a lot of folks in procurement who, who hate doing this because they know that they're leaving money on the table. Uh, when you have HVAC units that you're replacing after 15 years and you, and you know these units are you know, potentially uh, have another five or 10 years of life left in them. Um, but yeah, let's let's talk about some challenges on the visibility and control uh, for for your HVAC units. Uh, what we see often is uh, I've, I've done hundreds of of site surveys uh, over the years, um, and often we have this uh, a difference of of perce perception and reality uh, between director of facilities and and what's actually going on on site. Uh, when I'm speaking with folks uh, that are you know directors or in, in the office, uh, the corporate office. Uh, they might say something to the tune of, yeah, you know, we, uh, we have a corporate set point schedule and, and, and uh, standards and, uh, and those are enforced across all of our sites. And when you ask how they're enforced, they might say a lockbox or they might say, uh, you know, we have an SOP that's, that's involved. But every single time I go out and survey these sites uh, and, and get pictures and oftentimes with these folks, there's, there's a little bit of uh, shock and awe. Uh, at just how poorly run uh, these sites actually are. Operational drift is very real. So not having set schedules, uh, set points being set to you know, 68 degrees or 74 degrees, often in the same building. Uh, HVAC units are placed on permanent hold. The DOE uh, did a study, this is a little outdated now, it was back in 2015, but it showed that 50% uh, of commercial thermostats or thermostats in commercial buildings are set to permanent hold. Uh, my experience uh, has, has been, you know, a little bit higher than that uh, whenever I go out there and, and see these sites. Uh, so having, having thermostats set to permanent hold, having some thermostats set to heat while others are set to cool or auto, uh, having the timestamps be off uh, from thermostats. Uh, I just actually came back from a, a, a trip up in Boston a week ago and timestamps were off by seven, eight hours in, in a handful of the, the sites that I went to. So. Uh, not having visibility into uh, these issues is, is a real challenge because because you know there's this perception that things are running smoothly, uh, that things are maybe not as efficient as they could be, but they're running fairly efficiently. Uh, but then the second uh, problem is is if you have that that uh, insight into what's actually going on, being able to actually enforce those those standards and control those standards while providing some sort of uh, breathing room for for folks at site to to feel like they have some level of control uh, can can be a challenge. Great. So, how do we kind of address some of those challenges? Um, we we'll start off with best practices, and best practices for schedules um, can include some of the following points. So, number one. Um, limit the runtime of your HVAC units via setback, especially when zones are unoccupied. Um, so this helps you by reducing your energy consumption, also helps you by reducing the wear and tear on mechanical equipment, and it increases the lifespan of your units. Um, second would be keep properly functioning units in auto mode with a dead band between heat and cool set points. Auto mode will allow the units to switch between heat and cool call when they need to, and the dead band helps to reduce competing runtime. So what we want to avoid is having a, an HVAC unit call for cooling and then in the very next interval adjacent call for heating and then battle itself throughout the day. That's going to lead to um, extremely high wear and tear on a gas or an electric unit. Uh, and it's also going to cause unnecessary energy consumption that we want to avoid and run the building as efficiently as possible. And then finally, using overrides or changing set points, um, overriding sparingly when comfort is temporarily influenced by outside factors. So you may find yourself in a position where um, folks on site have to prop open a door to receive a shipment, or there's increased foot traffic during lunchtime. Um, that may prompt a comfort concern and using an override sparingly, which you know may run for 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 90 minutes, and then allow the unit to return back to its scheduled set point is gonna avoid unnecessary energy consumption. And by doing so also avoid excess wear and tear on mechanical equipment. So um, all of these you know, schedule strategies are uh, essentially trying to limit your HVAC runtime. And then um, what goes with schedules is gonna be, you know, what do you use as your set point? So talking about um, the top two, so I'll talk about occupied cooling set points and then unoccupied cooling set points. 
their recommendations for heat set points are just below those. So what we would recommend, and this is, you know, assuming that you have properly functioning units in spaces, you know, properly sized and uh, no, you know, no known exceptions or no known compressor outages, um, things can respond the way that they are expected to respond. Um, good, better, best for occupied cooling set point would be 70 is good, 72 at better, 74 or above at best. And these settings, especially best practice, is going to reduce, you know, the runtime of your HVAC equipment, which will in turn, like I keep mentioning, reduce unnecessary wear and tear, extend the life of your equipment. Then when the spaces are not occupied, the units can go into an unoccupied cooling mode. So we can increase the cooling set point since no one is in the space. We don't need to condition it down to the level that we would need to when there's, there's bodies in the space. So best practice would be to go to 80 degrees or potentially above based on how well your unit's able to recover and maybe things like your climate zone. Um, these are gonna be best practice recommendations for units that are able to respond properly and condition spaces effectively and consistently. Uh, and then, you know, talking about how changing your set points can influence your overall energy consumption. So HVAC consumption can be 35 to 60% of most commercial buildings overall energy consumption. So 35 to 60% of your energy balance. And by changing set points, just one degree in the energy consuming direction could mean two to 3% more uh, consumption from the HVAC equipment. And then all the way up to changing in five degrees can be nine to 12%. So you notice that this um, you know, percent difference in changing set points, it's not linear. It goes up almost exponentially. So um, you know, by changing set points significantly, you can really increase runtime significantly. You can increase your energy expenditure significantly as well as a result. Oh, this is still me. So uh, we also have some advanced control algorithms. And these are things that can be implemented to help you know, marginally improve um, savings and also improve the lifespan of your HVAC equipment. So starting with load curtailment, load curtailment basically works by predicting when you're going to have a peak interval for your overall building's consumption. And when a predicted peak happens, the HVACs are allowed to drift usually two degrees from their occupied set point. So they'll drift two degrees in the energy conserving direction to not only reduce the severity of the peak, but also to reduce the runtime of the unit, which will help, you know, again, extend the, the equipment's lifetime and is a more efficient way to run your building. Um, this algorithm is dynamic, so it works on a seven day rolling maximum demand. So if you're about to reach, you know, some threshold of your maximum demand within the last seven days, this will automatically kick in and help to, um, you know, reduce the severity of your next peak and also operate your building efficiently and prevent unnecessary wear and tear on your units. Um, next two are sort of related. So HVAC recovery and HVAC setback. Um, I'll start by talking about HVAC recovery. So HVAC recovery helps by giving sort of a stair step between your unoccupied settings. So if I'm using the cooling anecdote we talked about earlier, if we have an unoccupied cooling set point of 80 degrees and we need to transition down to 74 by the time folks arrive, HVAC recovery can learn the slope, so how many degrees change over time for each of the zones and only run the unit for as long as it needs to to get within a few degrees of set point. So this is a good way to kind of slowly turn things on and for um, you know a dynamic control strategy. Um, it's, it's very similar to HVAC recovery and setback are very similar to optimal start stop. So if folks are familiar with that from maybe incentive programs that you've enrolled in. Um, but they take it a step further because we use machine learning to figure out how long is going to be necessary for this unit to start optimally. And then with setback, very similar, how long is it going to take for this unit to drift if we turn it off right away? So we allow the units to sort of um, incrementally come on and incrementally turn off, ratchet up and down. All right. So moving from reactive proactive maintenance, uh, really the, the problem here is in the reactive world, we're firefighting uh, and we have a, a problem with prioritization uh, and triaging issues. So uh, what, do, what do we typically see a lot of folks doing in the facility world? Uh, we see folks tracking issues on spreadsheets, uh, trying to figure out you know, which, which sites to go to first. Uh, there's never enough time, never enough money to address every single issue. Um, and, and you know some of them are, are more sophisticated folks are, are using you know, uh, facility software uh, like service channel or SMS assist to, to automate some of these tickets, but still there's a lot of uh, spreadsheet work just to help 
prioritize and triage some of these issues. Uh, manual inspections, I mentioned this earlier, uh, if you don't have data coming from the site and you have to rely on, on information from a store manager, uh, then the, the only way to, to really understand the severity is to, to roll a truck. Um, oftentimes is unnecessary. Uh, it's, it's a thermostat that somebody accidentally hit the mode uh, or, or they were trying to adjust the set point and they hit mode and they turned it to heat when it should be cooling um, or, or some issue like that. So, so these kind of unnecessary truck rolls uh, often are, are the result or the, the outcome from these manual inspections. Uh, first in, first out ticket system, that's if you're lucky. Uh, if you have the bandwidth to be able to, to get to all of your tickets, uh, a lot of folks we see just doing that. Um, the, the, as a ticket comes in, it, it just gets in line and uh, gets addressed next. Uh, the last uh, option here is, I think, probably something a little bit more familiar with a lot of folks, which is we get more tickets than we'd like. Uh, we get more tickets than we have the capacity to go and address. So the squeaky wheel gets the oil. So the folks, the sites that are complaining the most, uh, four or five, six calls that, that week, that becomes priority. Uh, it's it, and the, the loudest, uh, the loudest sites tend to be what we would consider most severe. Uh, that doesn't always line up with reality. Again, this is uh, an issue of perception versus reality, uh, and that's where having data to move to a more proactive maintenance strategy, uh, I think, could be very helpful. Help. Yeah, so how can you proactively monitor your HVAC units and what does that HVAC health analysis looks like? Um, so at Gridpoint, we have an HVAC health report and we have different types of exceptions. So we realize that it's important to not only quantify the exceptions and their severity, but also qualify them. So how do we qualify these and how do we define these? Well, they fit into different categories with varying priorities or severities. And so starting at the top, a priority one issue would be for a solution where we have you know HVAC controlled, we have duct temperature sensors and we have submetering. So we know how much energy demand or power demand we're seeing for each individual asset. So the top two exceptions that are priority one would be that the unit are, is not drawing power or cooling um, or same with heating. So that means that the units are showing as zero KW submetering and the duct temperature is showing that it's not adequate to actually condition the space. Um, I'm gonna use the cooling analogy that we have been using since the beginning, um, where you know if your cooling set point is say 70 degrees and what's coming out of the supply is 85 degrees because it's 95 outside, you're actually exacerbating that issue. You're making it worse by dumping warm air into a space um, that's already you know warm and you're not, you're not providing cool air. Um, if in turn, the unit is not showing any power demand, then you can say, hey, there's, there's probably a problem with the compressor. Um, maybe the fan is running, but there's probably an issue with the compressor. So we should go take a look at the compressor and resolve that you know, as soon as possible. Uh, the next you know, priority two issues would be that the unit's not cooling or the unit's not heating. So it may be trending power demand, but again, you know, the zone is not at set point and the duct temperature is showing that it's at an inadequate level for cooling. So same example, if our, if our set point is at 70 degrees and our supply temp is 85, again, exacerbating the issue and making it worse. So for these, the recommendation is verify with onsite personnel, um, you know, talk to the manager and say, hey, is, is it true? Is it really pretty hot in there? If they say yes, okay, maybe we can consider changing the HVAC mode to heat only or turning it off to avoid dumping warm air into a space that is already not conditioned well. Um, and then, you know, of course, recommending service within 72 hours, especially if you can confirm that, yes, there is a, there is a comfort issue on site. Um, the next two exceptions would be priority three. So unit cooling, but not reaching set point or heating, but not reaching set point, very similar. But in this case, the duct temp monitoring shows that there actually is adequate conditioning. So um, in the example that I keep coming back to where we have a 70 degree occupied cool set point and the duct temp shows maybe 55 or 60 degrees, well, that's cool air. And if that air is making its way to the space and the actual zone temperature is 75 degrees, you know, they're five degrees above the cooling set point, which we're using 70 in this example, um, this could mean that the unit is undersized. So it maybe it can't provide a high enough volume of air to fully satisfy that set point in that zone. Um, it could mean that there is an external source of heat that's located too close, ambient heat source located too close to the thermostat or the zone sensor. And that could be in the form of an oven. Um, it could be on a wall that is close enough to a window where you're getting thermal gain from you know, solar 
insulation coming in. Um, and then the same could be true with heating season. You know, if you have a thermostat located on an exterior wall that's not well insulated, you may see that the zone temperature is, is pretty far below the heating set point. Um, even though the unit is supplying warm air to the space, the zone is still below heat set point. It could mean that you have a sensor that's influenced by um, some, you know, adjacent cold air infiltration. Or, you know, of course, uh, if, if thermostats or sensors are located too close to doors that are, that are often, you know, heavily trafficked, um, that can influence the sensor as well. So being able to qualify these different types of exceptions helps us make data-driven decisions about how we want to proactively work on HVAC health. And then of course, prioritizing those. So we have these kind of broken out into one, two, and three. We know which are gonna be the most severe issues and which are gonna most likely cause the most comfort concerns. And we know which issues are gonna be important for us to keep in mind, but aren't gonna necessarily require immediate action or immediate attention. So what does this report actually look like? We went through the report definitions. Um, I skipped the last two, but that's okay. Those would be assuming that we don't have supply temp sensors. So that would just be that the zone is either above the cooling set point or below the heating set point. We don't know what the supply is. We just know that the zone is not satisfied. So for a single site, this report might look like this. So this particular operator was a um, auto, auto dealership located in Katy, Texas. And um, we see the top one for AC18 certified service lobby. Uh, over this 22 day reporting period, it had 18 total cooling issues. So that's 18 in red. And then we go two columns over to the right, which says unit cooling, but not reaching set point. So of those 18 exceptions, 16 days, the unit was cooling, but it wasn't reaching set point. So that's that sort of priority three level exception. Um, but on two of those days out of 22, the unit was not cooling at all. So it wasn't providing adequate uh, supply temperature to the space to properly condition the zone. Now, we talked about best practices earlier. So there's an occupied cooling set point for this unit at 67 degrees. That is outside of what we would recommend for best practice. And then finally, the column on the far right is average zone versus set point delta. So this is how far was the zone temperature from its configured set point. So on average, let's just round up and say six degrees. So if our occupied cooling set point is 67 and we're actually averaging 73, well, maybe we should consider raising the set point to somewhere around 73 so we give that unit a chance to have some relief. If it's not going to consistently meet 67, we got to return to best practices and say, hey, what is the data telling me? We're not giving this unit a chance to breathe. This is going to cause premature failure of the unit. So then we go into what this report might look like for an enterprise. Um, if you have you know, hundreds or thousands of sites, potentially you're servicing, you, you can't possibly look at a report like we just saw on the previous to get an idea of overall, how is your fleet performing in terms of HVAC health? And that's what this slide aims to do. So the pie chart in the top left is sort of an overall score for your HVAC health for an enterprise. So of all of these units at all of these sites, 93% of the units had not had an issue during this reporting period, and 7% did have an issue during this reporting period. And then just below the pie chart, we have those, you know, report level qualifications that we talked about earlier. So different severities, right? Um, unit cooling, but not reaching set point is the priority three. And then unit not cooling is gonna be higher priority at priority two. So unit not cooling means that, you know, we're not getting adequate temperature air in the supply and going into the zone to condition the space. So of the units that had an exception during this reporting period, 75% of those units were not cooling. So that's kind of your, um, this kind of your go-to list to find out, hey, where do I need to pri prioritize my service tickets? And if I'm having a tech on site for PM, you know, which, which units should I have them try to focus on first that we know already have confirmed issues, mechanical issues on site, or you know, unit not responding the way we expect it to. Um, then finally, the far right-hand column in that table that's just below the pie chart, average zone versus set point delta. So for all of these units that have had exceptions, on average, um, you know, how far away from set point were they? 4.2 degrees. So this is this is an important report to run, you know, maybe even monthly or quarterly, and it's going to change obviously seasonally. So we're going to see heating exceptions in the winter, cooling exceptions in the summer. Um, and then you may see a mix of both in the shoulder season, depending on, um, you know, what the temperature is like on any given day. So, you know, by comparing these each month, 
and looking at the average zone versus sepoid delta, you can sort of get an idea of how severe, um, you know, are we moving in the right direction? If we have, you know, rolled trucks and tried to fix these units that we know have consistently had heating issues, did that metric of average zone versus set point delta go down or is it going up? And, you know, of course, it's also important to consider, um, has the weather been more extreme this month versus last month when we ran this report? Um, are the same units on this report or are they all different units? Um, but this is a way that we can kind of manage all that chaos and also look at it from a high level view to get an idea of overall, how well are we performing? Well, 93% of units without issues in a month is not bad. Then, you know, as an example of how we can break this down for um, high priority issues. So these are sorted, the um, bar chart is sorted by the units that were the farthest from their set point. So the highest average zone versus set point delta. These are just the top five most severe for this reporting period. Um, so you can see that top one at Regina uh, AC3 was an average of eight degrees above its set point. That's really significant. So, you know, first of all, we want to make sure that the unit is properly maintained. So potentially, you know, roll a truck, especially if this is um, consistent, which it really is. And then second, you know, make sure that the occupied cooling set point is at or above best practice. And in this case, it already is. So this was a significant issue that we ended up, you know, having to roll, the customer ended up having to roll a truck for to get resolved. And they made a data-driven decision to lead them to that conclusion. All right. So what are the benefits of centralized control? I'm going to start at the bottom there. Uh, we, we spoke about this a couple of times already, but uh, if, if you want to build a corporate standard across all of your sites and be able to enforce it and manage against it, you need to have centralized control. Uh, you can't rely on emails and uh, uh, just faith in, in your uh, site managers, the MODs to, uh, to enforce that corporate standard. Um, the second thing is operational drift. So now that you've, you've got this corporate standard and you, you've baselined all of your sites against, uh, against, against the standard, the, the schedules, the set points, the overrides, all of that, uh, we need to make sure that, that we're preventing operational drift. If a, if a thermostat loses power and comes back online, a timestamp gets reset, uh, we, that, that contributes to operational drift. If somebody uh, hits per, uh, permanent hold, that contributes to operational drift. If somebody adjusts the, uh, the fan mode or the HVAC mode, that contributes to operational drift. If somebody adjusts the set point and you have one thermostat trying to cool to 72 and another th thermostat cooling to 68, so the other one's not kicking on at all, uh, that contributes to operational drift. This, this kind of stuff happens across the board. Uh, having a centralized control helps you, number one, identify when these kind of issues uh, pop up, when operational drift starts to kind of rear its ugly head. Uh, and then secondly, make in, in just a bulk update, uh, make a, an adjustment to, to move back to corporate standards. Uh, and the last thing is just save time and money. Uh, you can do this across hundreds of sites with just a few clicks. Uh, if you have centralized control. If you don't, then it takes a painstaking pro uh, process and project uh, to make updates. And you might want to do this temporarily. You could have uh, a, a heat wave coming into Texas where I'm at right now, and you might have 60 sites in Texas. Uh, and you know that folks are going to complain, and you're trying to, you're trying to uh, prepare for that. So you've decided that, okay, we're going to drop the set points by a degree for this heat wave. The heat wave is going to be a week and a half. Uh, because we want to really limit our hot cold calls uh, coming in. So you make that adjustment across 60 sites uh, and it takes a few clicks if you have centralized control. And when that week and a half is up and the heat wave is gone, uh, you can come back into the system uh, and adjust it back to the baseline, back to your corporate standard uh, with, with a few clicks. If you don't have centralized control, uh, this requires a lot of emails, a lot of follow-ups, a lot of trust and faith uh, in, in the SOPs and, and the the managers that are actually on site. Uh, so, you know, a lot of benefits from centralized control uh, by, by bringing it all in-house uh, in, in one place. Okay, so how do we, how do we mitigate operational drift? And, and what are some strategies that we can leverage to respond to that? Uh, how about a scorecard? So we talked about best practices kind of at the top of, of my section. Um, during my spiel. So um, looking at those best practices and then seeing how well we're adopting them is an important way to quantify 
you know, how, how is our recommendation or how is our adoption of recommendations uh, stacking up? So, you know, we can review set points, modes, and advanced control. So we talked about set points. We talked about uh, HVAC and fan modes. We talked about our algorithms. Um, have a comparison, you know, compare to other sites that may be in your vertical and see, um, you know, compared to my peers, how well am I, how well am I deploying best practice recommendations? And then finally, opportunities. So if um, my score isn't where I want it to be, or, you know, if I, if I really want to improve my efficiency and um, enhance equipment lifespan, what, what, where, where do I have opportunities to do so? Um, and the, the breakdown of scorecard kind of works like this. So on the left-hand side, we have zero points for um, units that would be set outside best practice. On the right-hand side of the table, we have our best practice recommendations. So talking about occupied coal set point, we mentioned you know greater than 74, occupied heat set point, less than 67, then you know, we have our unoccupied recommendations and so on down the line. Um, of course, setting fans in auto wherever possible is gonna prevent unnecessary base load. So if you have a fan in on mode 24 seven, you have a base load for that, even, even you know, potentially when the site is unoccupied. So that's extra wear and tear on that equipment. And it's also extra energy expenditure for you as the operator. Um, we talked about overrides as well. So best practices for overrides. Um, you know, try to limit the use of overrides, use them during extenuating circumstances, but, you know, try not to return to the thermostat every hour or every two hours or whatever it is periodically to override the unit. Um, put in appropriate set points based on best practices and use overrides when there's some outside source impacting your, your site's comfort level. Then finally, adopt the algorithm. So, uh, being able to transition as efficiently as possible and avoid unnecessary HVAC runtime is crucial to making sure that you, you keep track of your HVAC health. So what does this scorecard sort of look like when we're actually using it to score and when we're using it to compare to a vertical benchmark, compare you to your peers? So this example, I'm using the auto dealership again. Um, so for this particular auto dealership, their score was 76% in the scorecard compared to their vertical benchmark of 71%, they're doing relatively better than their peers. So that's great. So this is an opportunity to kind of celebrate, hey, you're better than average, so keep at it. Um, and to give an idea of how these are scored, we looked at the definition of the scorecard in the previous slide. So how this works is um, the setting across the, you know, across the columns shows us what we're looking at. So for occupied cooling set point, we're looking at a setting of 72 degrees. That's what this customer's average occupied cooling set point was across their 24 units. So that gives them a score of two out of a possible five points, which gives their opportunity score three points. So what we wanna do here is focus on where we have the biggest areas of opportunity to improve our efficiency, increase our equipment lifespan, make sure that we are you know, operating this site as, as intelligently as we possibly can and use these, this scorecard to reduce operational drift and review this scorecard periodically, at least monthly, to see is our score going up? Has it gone down? Why did it go up or down? And where do we have other opportunities? If we have to adjust um, cooling set points in certain zones because of comfort issues, are there other zones that we can adjust so that we don't change our score or so, so that our score maybe even improves? Um, if we have a make to make a sacrifice in one zone, can we make up for that with another zone? And can we maintain the score that we want? Um, we should shoot for, you know, if we start out at 76 and that's where we want to stay, then we shouldn't see that score lower. So if there are changes that need to be made, we need to look for other opportunities to make that change back up because that's going to lead to, like we've said, um, you know, unnecessary energy expenditure, increase in HVAC runtime, and potentially premature failure of the units. So um, I'm not going to go through every single one of these settings and how the scores are allocated. Um, I believe that that is pretty straightforward. But looking at the areas of opportunity, we have occupied cooling set point, which we talked about. Um, of these 24 units, 79% of them were set to auto mode. So there's opportunity there. 21% of the units were set in on 24-7, or sorry, during the occupied period. Um, during their unoccupied period on the flip side, all of them were set to auto, which is at best practice. So this gives us an opportunity to show us where we have opportunities to do better and also where we're already doing well at best practice. So it's kind of a, okay, let's celebrate what we're doing well. Let's look at what we're not doing as well and see if we can improve our score or at least stay where we are if we need to make any changes. 
Okay, so the takeaway from the scorecard might look like this. So as I mentioned, the solution was a auto dealership with 24 controlled HVACs. They were prepackaged RTUs with electric heat. Um, so what were our opportunities? Okay, the biggest one with three points in opportunity score was the occupied cool set point. So wherever possible, increase the occupied cooling set points. If we can get to an average of 73 degrees up from 72, then we'll have three points instead of only two points for that category. And that'll improve our overall score 76% even further past the vertical benchmark. Um, and it all depends on, on what your goals are. So it's important to align you know, what you want your scorecard to be with what your goals are. Um, finally, you know, or, or next, set fan modes to auto. So we talked about 79% of the units did have their fan modes in auto, 21% did not during the occupied hours. So do we have opportunities to set some of those fans to auto mode? Um, that'll, that'll prevent you know, additional base load for those HVAC units and will reduce you know, the runtime of the fan and help to lengthen the lifespan of that equipment. Uh, then finally, override thresholds, which we really didn't talk about on the previous slide, uh, but we did talk about on the scorecard definition slide. Um, uh, there were a couple opportunities for override thresholds being you know, two degrees during occupied, five degrees during unoccupied. That's pretty standard out of the box, but if you can go you know, two degrees occupied, two degrees unoccupied, then that'll also help you know, bolster your score, and it'll also help with some marginal energy efficiency gains. All right, so benchmarking your assets. Uh, why is that important? Ultimately, it, it comes down to moving to a more proactive maintenance and, and replacement strategy. Uh, we talked about this earlier. You've, you've got really two options in, in the space today, which is uh, run to fail or scheduled, uh, unless you have data to to provide that benchmarking. And what we see today is uh, a spectrum where you have folks on one side, which uh, who, who probably couldn't even tell you how many uh, HVAC units they have at every site. And that's actually more common than, than not. Uh, so let alone, you know, doing any sort of benchmarking uh, or testing or anything like that other units. So uh, so that it would of course be more on the, on the run to fail side. Um, and then we have some folks that are spending uh, spending money to have folks as they go out there do some preventative maintenance to to maybe do some SEER testing or some efficiency testing in the units. And if you get that information and you start trending that over time, you can start making some data driven decisions on on you know a replacement strategy uh, or uh, um, a repair and maintenance strategy as well for these units. Uh, that's costly. You know, every time you do that, you, you instead of just replacing uh, filters and maybe cleaning out docks every once in a while. Uh, you, you've got guys spending, you know, a few hours at, at each site. Uh, you'll you'll spend, you know, five, five hundred to thousand dollars to get that done. So um, that, those are the options today, uh, unless you have some sort of system uh, that, that can automate some of this data collection uh, and some of this benchmarking. Uh, what was it today or what was it a year ago? What was it six months ago? What is it today? What is it going to potentially look like six months from now? Uh, so th those are the options uh, for, for benchmarking. Great. So one of the opportunities you have for benchmarking your HVAC units is um, running an HVAC scope test. And I really feel strongly that Gerald should be presenting the slide because he was the product manager that helped design HVAC scope. Um, but I just use the tool. So I will uh, share my experience, but Gerald is the true expert here. So just had to chirp him a little bit for that. But essentially, uh, HVAC scope is automatic HVAC testing delivered. And we really like to use this tool before seasonal changes. So, you know, right now we're kind of nearing shoulder season, um, the in-between of heating season in the winter and cooling season in the summer. So now is probably a good time to start thinking about testing units in cooling mode before we enter cooling season. And then we end up in that reactive approach again, right? So we can do this by running tests remotely and determining which units are responding the way we would expect them to and which units um, didn't pass the test or didn't respond the way we expect them to. That way we have an idea of where we may have comfort concerns before they even happen, before the season actually changes. So this can be on demand or scheduled, which really makes this a, a powerful tool because you can do your PMs and then you can run scope again and see, you know, hey, do I have a, a lower failure rate now? Because I just did PMs, so I should, right? Um, it can be single site, multi-site or fleet-wide testing. So this can be a really, really powerful tool for not only benching your HVAC units, but also you know, mitigating operational drift that we were talking about earlier. So we have the performance test, which basically calculates a rate of change for each mode. 
So we start the unit out in idle mode, we purge the duct, and then we allow the fan to run, we take measurements, and then we allow cooling to happen, we take measurements, we allow heating to happen, we take measurements. So we're basically wanting to see how far was the supply temperature and the zone temperature influenced during this test. And it's a very brief test. We usually run these during the unoccupied hours. So this does not interfere with normal business operations. And then from all of the data that we're collecting, we can again quantify, but not only quantify, we can qualify. We can add priority to um, you know, which units had all out failures, which units failed in only one mode. Are we testing only one mode? Um, which units failed in multiple stages? Things like that. So I kind of talked about some of this a little bit, but you know, this is really beneficial during seasonal changes. So running this before we end, we end up in the cooling season and put us on the back foot and end up in a reactive situation. Um, this can also help for demand response readiness. So do you want to make sure that you um, are able to shave the peak that you're nominating? Then you want to make sure that your equipment is in good working order mechanically. And this is a good way to do that. This gives you ammunition to say, hey, you know, where do I have opportunities to focus? Um, and then, of course, initial HVAC issue diagnosis. So um, this is going to sound like it's pretty similar to the HVAC health report. It's not. It's fundamentally different. And the main difference is the HVAC health report churns every single day and shows you what your issues are over the past few days or over the past month or over the past year, um, whatever. So the, the HVAC health report is more of a historically, this is what's happening. And recently, these are the measurements that have been taken. These are your average temps or these are your average you know, kilowatt hours consumed per unit. Um, per site, things like that. So it's it's good to know what's going on as of the past X number of days or months. But HVAC scope testing is really for future um, events that may happen, seasonal changes, demand response readiness, like we mentioned. So this kind of tees you up to know where you may have issues before they arrive. And then HVAC Health gives you a summary of what those issues already were. Let's quantify them, qualify them, give them to you so you can make informed data-driven decisions on how you want to respond to those. Okay, so what would this potentially look like? So this was a uh, test done for uh, a, a relatively small pilot. So only four locations, 18 total HVAC units. And this was run in the fall before we truly enter heating season for this particular customer based on their geography. So um, this result wasn't great. Keep in mind, only four sites, 18 units. But of those total 18 units, 71% failed, only 29% passed. So you know we're coming to this customer saying, um, here's what you need to do. You need to prioritize first sites that have the highest percentage of failed units. So um, this is this is you know dummy data. This is uh, real data, but um, any you know identifying information has been masked. So we're calling these site one, two, three, and four, five, six. So uh, this is real data though. And for these two sites, 100% of their units failed in heat. So we told this customer, you're going to have comfort concerns when you enter heating season because none of these units heat. So we would definitely recommend prioritizing these first. And especially, you know, if they're in some of the coldest regions. Um, so if you have if you have a lot of sites spread out across a lot of different climate zones, um, you know, if you maybe are servicing sites up in Canada or, you know, or up in uh, the Northeast United States, those may be areas that you want to look first because they're going to get cold first. Um, and then, you know, kind of work your way down the list from there. Um, <clears throat> next, you know, repair units with failure and realized comfort issues. So if you've had tickets open by store managers or you've had um, hot cold calls or whatever it is from folks that are on site saying, hey, we've got an issue here. Then you go to your scope results and see, oh, well, it looks like this unit actually failed the test. So yeah, now we have what we talked about earlier. We have you know quantified and qualified evidence, but we also have anecdotal evidence that, yeah, there's comfort concern there. Then finally, um, making note of test results and direct HVAC service vendors during PMs. So, you know, if you're if you're already going to schedule recurring PMs and you're going to do fall PMs to get ready for winter, um, run this report before you do it. That way you have a targeted list of, of where to focus because we've run this diagnostic test and we know where you have um, potential risks for comfort concerns due to unit failures in this test. All right, we're going to go into our next poll question, and I apologize, I am going to put up um, what was our first poll question originally. That should be up on your screen now. Um, this question is, what is the most pressing HVAC challenge you are experiencing today? Time, budget constraints, 
supply chain issues, lack of insight into site locations or other. I'll give everybody just a minute to go ahead and fill that out. And to answer the poll question that we had earlier, as we remember, rent to fail was um, uh, the most used strategy for HVAC replacement. All right, go ahead and share the results. So it looks like lack of insight into site locations, 39% of you said that is your most pressing HVAC challenge today. All right. Uh, again, not not surprising answers there. Budget, uh, a big concern. Uh, time, a big concern. I, I get that. Uh, so we spoke a lot about a lot about these challenges uh, throughout this presentation. Uh, let's talk for a few minutes. I know we're we're getting close on time, so I'll try to be brief and quick here uh, on on how energy management systems can help. So first, uh, HVAC insights, controls, optimization. That's pretty much this entire presentation. I think you get that. Uh, when you throw in more sensors that are tied into your control strategy, and you can do that with software automation and centralize it, uh, then you have a more intelligent feedback loop uh, for, for these controls. It's not just looking at zone temperature. It's looking at lots of other things. You have algorithms that can leverage these, these sensors to make smarter control decisions, these micro adjustments uh, throughout the days and the weeks. Uh, and then you have the ability to, to make these overrides and, and, uh, and find anomalies uh, just kind of spoon fed to you through some of these analytics reports and, and tests. Uh, if you look over on the left hand side, uh, we've got sub metering uh, that just provides more data uh, for, for our reporting, our analytics, our benchmarking, our testing, et cetera. And then at the top left, we also have uh, sensor data uh, that we can throw in as well. So temperature and CO2, humidity. This isn't just for uh, the reporting and finding anomalies. It's also, I mentioned, for the smart feedback loop. If you have humidity issues uh, and you're trying to squeeze a little bit of humidity out of relative humidity out of your, your space, that humidity sensor can, can talk to your HVAC unit and have it run the stage one compressor uh, to drop humidity a little bit. Same thing with CO2. We could have a CO2 sensor that talks to your HVAC unit, uh, to your thermostat, and, to, and tells us to, to bring in some fresh air uh, to, to kind of swap out the air there. So uh, if you look in the top right, uh, we have a more holistic approach uh, to an energy management system that is to controlling your building. It's not just HVAC, it's lighting controls. It's really anything that you turn on and off, uh, vent hoods, things like that. Let's get those things automated. And then let's bring in more uh, sensors and, and uh, alarms and, and things like that around refrigeration just to, to kind of help with food quality. So all this helps you manage your building uh, from a facility and operations perspective uh, and move from reactive to proactive. Now let's look at the, the savings side. So when you control everything as a system, it allows us to, to really be the, the conductor of an orchestra. Uh, we can tell HVAC to turn on at certain points and then lighting to, to, to throttle at certain points. And uh, as we see that, you know, an EV charger or refrigeration compressor is going through, or the refrigeration unit is going through a defrost cycle, we can use this di these different uh, the sensors and the controls that we're doing at a site to, to start balancing the load. Because you're not built, uh, your energy bill isn't, isn't built based on how much you, your HVAC is consuming at any given point. You're built at a building level. Uh, and all of these assets are contributing to your energy usage at a building level. So you need something that is considering all of these assets and how they're consuming energy throughout the day and how your tariff is structured and are you on a time of use rate or are you, do you get, uh, get billed for peak demand uh, or uh, demand charges? All of that contributes to our control strategy from a building perspective. Uh, so, so you really need something that can control it all together. Uh, and, and how does GridPoint do that specifically? Uh, we bundled everything into uh, into one SaaS feed. So hardware, uh, we provide the installation, we manage all the installation. So there's a white glove service there where everything is is done for you. Uh, and then we have our software and services, folks like Jack and folks on his team that are dedicated to taking everything you see on the right there, uh, these complex graphs, 
Uh, they, they build a lot of this stuff for you. A lot of it's out of the box uh, already, but they will build custom reports and graphs for you and they'll make sense of it. Uh, what we see, what people like me uh, see is just a bunch of lines and dots and charts. What Jack sees is, uh, is uh, opportunity to make some changes, to, to save more energy, to save more money, to be a little bit more proactive. And he helps distill that kind of stuff down to you. Uh, and that's part of our services that, that's bundled together. Uh, and we really see if you don't have it all bundled together and you piecemeal things together, you're, you're missing a lot of value. So what does this look like? Uh, here's just a quick example, 100 site restaurant operator here. Uh, all 100 sites enrolled into the, the Gridpoint uh, intelligence platform, uh, they have a combination of value being, being driven. One is demand response. So they're seeing about $115,000 uh, come in, in uh, for, for demand response participation. This is revenue paid from the utility to the restaurant to uh, have all of that automated through the Gridpoint intelligence platform. The second bucket there is uh, is a rebates and incentives for participation in, in this demand response program. Oftentimes, you'll you'll have utilities that, especially in California, but we have them everywhere: uh, East Coast, Midwest, Texas, California. There are rebates everywhere that utilities are trying trying to give you money uh, to participate in certain programs. Maybe it's reducing your load. Maybe it's peak shaving. Maybe it's demand response. Maybe it's load shifting. Uh, there are a lot of different programs out there. Uh, that have have different levers that you're trying to, that that they ask for you to pull. All can be done through the the Gridpoint platform, and again, that's a managed service that we will take care of for you. So that's real money that comes back in your pocket. And then on an annual basis for for these hundred sites, they're seeing you know nearly half a million dollars of energy cost avoidance uh, every single year for this site. So you know you add it all up for a hundred sites, and and you have you know real dollars that are you know really moving the needle. Uh, for this customer here, uh, and all of this from the equipment uh, to the installation to the installation management uh, to the software, all of this is automated and handled through the, the kind of bundled offer here at Gridline. Okay, on to our last poll, and again, we'll make this very quick if we only have a few minutes left, uh, but our poll number three is how are you being alerted to HVAC issues currently? Uh, are you calls from store managers, submitted maintenance tickets, or an automated ticket from an EMS or BMS system? I'll give everyone just like 20 seconds to get this in. All right, it looks like Calls from store managers, 56% of you said that is the number one way you are being alerted to HVAC issues. All right, we'll go ahead and run into our questions now. We did have a few um, that came in. Uh, first question, and um, Jack and Gerald, I'll let you both, you know, either one of you jump in and answer this, but what sensors are needed for HVAC health? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I can take that one. Um, there are going to be different report types based on the sensors that are available. And that's kind of the way that we set up those reports. So I mentioned the priority one issues are, are going to require CTs. So we need submetering of the HVAC assets. So if you don't have CTs, but you do have thermostats and supply temp sensors, then um, priorities two and three will apply to your solution. Um, then finally, the priority four issues would just be, we would just need a thermostat. That's all we would need. So regardless of <clears throat> um, regardless of what's installed, there is going to be a report or a set of reports that's going to be applicable to your solution. So the heavier solution, the more granular we can get with the data and the more you know, focus and emphasis we can put on how to prioritize. Uh, next question, do you install this system or are we expected to install it? Yeah, great question. Uh, we'll install it. Uh, we'll project manage it. We'll get the installer uh, set up, all, all our folks. If you have somebody that you work with that you really would prefer to, to handle your site, you already have a service contract, we're willing to, to you know talk about that and, and maybe work with them. But, but we, of course, would handle that installation process, the permitting, all 
Great. Uh, next question. Are demand savings reached via solely uh, the HVAC set point increase? Um, that's a really good question. And the answer is no, it's kind of all encompassing. So a lot can influence your building's energy demand and you can achieve demand savings by you know, implementing a lot of different strategies. Um, you can certainly reduce your overall building demand by keeping your set points you know, close to best practice. Or you know, if you wanna lower your demand and your current occupied cooling set point is 72, if you go to 74, you may very well lower your building's demand. You may not because HVAC runtime is influenced by weather. Um, so enrolling in things like demand response programs, which we talked about, is a great way to limit your, your demand. And uh, of course, we have the low curtailment algorithm, which is not exactly, but kind of similar to like real-time demand response. So those events are triggered by the controller and, and they're using machine learning. Those algorithm, that algorithm uses machine learning to figure out, okay, is my next peak going to reach um, you know, 95% of my peak in the last seven days. Well, if it is that I need to curtail HVACs and allow them to drift so that I don't increase the severity of my next peak. So um, really good question, but a lot of, a lot of things to unpack there. All right. Um, we're going to keep going just to get a couple more of these questions answered, but we'll, we're going to end in just a minute. And then any questions that are not answered, we'll go ahead and respond and send back to you. Um, we'll email over. Uh, is there a capital cost for the solution or can the solution be completely implemented as an OPEX? Yeah, I actually, I'll take this. There are a few questions around cost I see. Uh, so there is no capital cost for the solution. Of course, we have that as an option, uh, but the, the hardware, the labor, the installation, the installation management, all of that's $0 upfront. It's just a, it's a SaaS fee. So it's a monthly fee and uh, that goes into the, uh, so it is completely OPEX. That probably helps answer uh, a, a Z, uh, sorry if I'm not pronouncing that correctly, uh, your question as well, how much do the services cost? What's the ROI? Um, the, the ROI is in the first month. Uh, so you're gonna have an energy uh, cost reduction uh, in the first month, and you're gonna have a cost that's gonna be a monthly fee that we like to set uh, in, in, I'd say almost every scenario uh, we'll set, that we'll, we'll be able to get the monthly fee to where it's, uh, less than the energy savings. And then you have operational savings on top of that. Uh, so so the, the system's getting paid for by the energy savings. Uh, how much does a service cost? And I think David also asked, what's the sub subscription fee based on? It really is, the, uh, it's based on scope of work. So, uh, you know, we have large theater chains that have 30 rooftop units that are paying a much larger monthly fee than a uh, quick serve restaurant with two or three rooftop units. So it depends on the scope of work, uh, the size of the building, um, how much we're putting in, if we're putting in just HVAC control versus sub metering and refrigeration monitoring, all of that kind of stuff. So it's where we can, uh, we can design that solution for you and tell you, what, you know, where you're at. It's going to be, you know, on the low end, a couple hundred bucks on the high end, you know, a couple hundred bucks. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that's, that's the range there. Okay, last question, and then we'll go ahead and end the uh, webinar. And um, also the contact information is available on the screen now. Uh, but the question from Steve is, any data and power requirements I would need to provide for the sensors and gateway that you install? Um, I think maybe we can both kind of answer this one. So uh, data requirements, we need internet connection, um, or you know, we need some way for our controller to call home. And that can be either um, via ethernet on site, um, we can do static IP or DHCP. We can also use cell modems if you're um, in a very rural area and you don't, or you don't have um, internet on site. Um, power requirements, just, you know, just a couple spare breakers, I think. And Gerald, correct me if, or, you know, just. No, that's right. Yeah, it, w whether it's spare breakers, we also can just uh, use a wall wart, you know, a little plug that will we'll plug in that way. So if you either have, either have an open plug uh, or a spare breaker for us to uh, power the system, system that way. All right, great. Well, thank you very much, Gerald and Jack. That concludes our uh, webinar today. If we didn't answer a question, please feel free to email smartbuildings at gridpoint.com. Uh, you can also sign up for a free energy analysis at gridpoint.com slash energy dash analysis. Um, please uh, check your email uh, shortly. We will also be sending the recording of this webinar, like I said, uh, out in the next day or two. Thank you very much, everyone.